All right, uh, today we're going to talk about data management and metadata. Uh, we'll be doing an activity near the end of the session, so go ahead and download the data set uh, to your computer. Um, if uh, you are joining via the uh, live stream, there will be a part two data set, so go ahead and download that as well. Um, this URL will also be in the chat, and it will be available when we get to that, that part of the presentation, too. Okay. So, I think a good place to start is just talking about what I mean when I say metadata, and I'm talking about any kind of data about data. Uh, this is a very broad loose category. Uh, it includes lots of different formats and schemas. Um, it can be found in lots of different places. It might be embedded in your data. It might be in a database outside of your data. Um, it can be very brief or it can be very detailed. Uh, it can be very structured or it can be very flat. And there are a lot of functions of metadata, a lot of reasons that we use metadata, and those reasons and our needs are going to drive a lot of our choices as far as what metadata we use. Um, so here's an example of metadata, is cataloging. Uh, and I like to bring this one up because as I work in cataloging and metadata, I get the question a lot, what's the difference between the two? Because um, they're very similar and they can be used interchangeably. Um, by a lot of people uh, and I think I think the difference between them really is the usage of the word uh, so whenever people talk about cataloging they're typically talking about describing bibliographic data uh, it's usually in a library context and they're usually talking about particular standards um, like uh, for content standards it's either going to be done in RDA or in ACR2 and for a format standard, um, it's typically going to be in MARC or in BibFrame. These are, these are just different standards related to cataloging or library metadata. Um, but metadata can look like a lot of different things. So it can look like XML files uh, that are very structured, very complicated. Uh, but it can also look like the cover of this VHS tape. It also has lots of nice metadata on it. It has a title and a publisher, and a series, and a subject, it's about this person. Um, and this is all, this is also metadata. Most people don't call it metadata. There are a lot of things that are metadata that aren't called that, um, because they're called the cover. Or for software, they can be called the documentation. Uh, in a lot of sciences, it's called annotation. Um, for texts, uh, like in digital humanities, sometimes it's called markup. Um, for those texts. Uh, if you have images or videos, it, um, file headers are an example of metadata. Uh, and in archives, we have finding aids instead of catalog records. So these are all um, lots of different examples. And um, so a lot of these, uh, we have different schemes that we use, metadata schema. Um, one of the most common you'll see is Dublin Core. And simple Dublin Core just looks like this. It has 15 elements, so title, creator, subject, description, publisher, contributor, date, type, format, identifier, source, language, relation, coverage, and rights. So when you're making a Dublin Core record, these are the elements that you can record. Um, it's a really nice schema because it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward to use it. Um, it's pretty commonly used. Um, so it, there, there are a lot of reasons to use it. Because it's commonly used, it's easier, it's easy to communicate your data to other people if you're using Dublin Core and they're using Dublin Core. Um, but it has some disadvantages too. Um, one of them is it might be a little too simple for your needs. Like what if you have two titles, like a title and an alternate title, and they're different to you? You could record them both. You could just repeat the title element and have them both in there, but you couldn't tell the difference between them. Or what if you had two contributors, like an illustrator and an editor, and they're, they're different in your record, but if you were doing this in just simple Dublin Core, then you would just have to record them both as contributor, and you wouldn't be able to tell. Um, 
for this reason. We also have qualified Dublin Core, which is very similar. Um, it has a lot of element, the same elements. Um, it's got some extra elements too, but the existing elements have qualifiers. So for example, date in qualified Dublin Core has these qualifiers like created, valid, available, issued, modified. So you could record as different kinds of dates, the date that say your data set was created or the date that it was last modified. And you could keep those differences straight in your own system. And if you needed to uh, communicate your data to someone who was using simple Dublin Core, then you could sort of flatten it down and say, oh, okay, well, all these dates are just dates. So they wouldn't be able to tell the difference, but it's not gonna affect your data. You don't have to change your data or record less just because you want to communicate with this other system. Um, so this is, this is also a nice option for metadata, but this is still not enough for a lot of people's data. Um, and for this reason, we have a lot of discipline specific schema as well. So within libraries, um, so we have EAD and DAX uh, for, that we use in archive, uh, archives. Uh, we have mods, uh, which is a standard we use for a lot of digital objects. Um, and other disciplines outside of libraries have their own schema as well. So uh, in life sciences, we have Darwin Core, probably meant to sound like Dublin Cores. We have Darwin Core, um, we have DDI, uh, the Data Documentation Initiative in Arts and Humanities. And then in geography, we have ISO 19115. They don't all have exciting names, um, but, they, but they are standards and common standards in use. Um, so last week was Love Your Data Week. And so I was following this tag on Twitter, this LYD17, and I kept seeing this rallying cry, which was that data should be fair. And by this, they mean findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So roughly, these are the findable means you should have good metadata, and that metadata should be indexed somewhere. Uh, your data should be accessible. So once you've found it, once you know where it is, you should be able to get at it, usually through an identifier of some kind. Um, it should be interoperable, uh, like we talked about with Dublin Core. So it should follow common metadata standards, things that other people are using, other people know how to interpret, and reusable. So it should be richly described um, and follow community standards of whoever you're working with. Uh, these are described in a lot more detail in this nice, uh, article in Nature called The Fair Guiding Principles for Scientific Data Management and Stewardship. Um, I like the word stewardship here. I think it lends kind of a dignity and kind of a gravity to the work that we're doing. I mean, because it's a lot of work to do this, um, but it's very important because how, how else in the future are peop people going to be able to use our data? Um, and there's this phrase, this nice quote from Jason Scott, which is that metadata is a love note to the future. And so it has kind of a romance to it that, that if, if I just do a good enough job on my metadata, then someday, somewhere, somebody is going to use my, my data. And it's going to be great. Um, but closer to the truth is that that person's going to be you and you're gonna need it much sooner than you think. So there's this saying about programming called Eagleson's Law, which is that any code of your own that you haven't looked at for six or more months might have been written by someone else. It might as well have been written by somebody else because you're not gonna remember what it is. And I think this is doubly true for data, especially if you're collecting a lot of data. Because really, how long are you gonna remember what's in which file? Or when and how it was collected? Or what are you supposed to do? What do those numbers mean? What am I supposed to do? How can I interpret this? And this may not seem like a big deal. I mean, you can say, well, of course I'm gonna remember. I'm gonna name my files in a certain way, or I'm gonna put them in a directory structure. And Windows keeps track. It knows the creation dates of all my files. Um, my photos seem to know when and where they were taken. My camera takes care of that. Um, uh, I have file names, they have a file format extension, and if I double click it, the, the right thing comes up, so my computer knows how to use this file. And my spreadsheet columns have labels, so that, surely that should be good enough to take care of using your data into the future. And it's a good start, and, and I want to note that all of this, these are all examples of metadata. So these are all good things to do, but they should be part of a larger plan 
to make sure you're really keeping track of everything that you need to keep track of. So we're gonna talk about a bunch of different categories of metadata. And the first one is descriptive metadata. Uh, so this describes your data, as you might expect. Um, and in particular, it allows for discovery and identification. So discovery is, um, it allows you to search through the metadata and find the data that you're looking for. Um, and identification um, is if you were searching and you found the right metadata, would you know just by looking at that metadata that it's for the data you're looking for, that you're interested in what, whatever's on the other side, if you wanna go download all of it. Um, some examples of descriptive metadata are title, creator, keywords or tags like subjects, uh, identifiers like DOIs, uh, geospatial coverage is a big one, um, and date, date is also one. Um, and I want to talk about date formats uh, because there are a lot of times in metadata where we want to uh, there, there are times when we can transcribe exactly what's on the data like the title for example um, But there are times when we want to pull things from a specific vocabulary like subjects or we want to record things in a different format or a certain format and be consistent about it like date and, and there are a lot of ways to record dates so uh, does anyone have any opinions on which one of these is best? I think Michael has an opinion. Does anyone else have an opinion? Yes, Ruth. Okay. Okay. Okay, so Ruth would go with the one that starts with the year first. And that is fortunate because it's the right answer. <laughs> I, I, I'm, yes, I'm going to make a very bold statement and say that is the right way to do dates in your data. And I feel so strongly about this. I have written poetry about this format. <laughs> so it's, it's a really great format. Um, so it allows for standardized recording of dates and times and weeks as of recently. Um, and one thing that's really nice about it is that sorting just works in this format. Like, uh, since, since it starts with the year, if you just sort it alphanumerically, that's just gonna how it's gonna appear naturally, like in your Windows folders. It's just going to appear in order, even if they have different granularity, even if some of them are only the year, some of them are the year and the month, some of them are the year and the month and the day, they're just going to appear roughly in the right order if you record them this way. Um, and it's also an international standard and it's also pretty commonly used. Um, so one place that you'll probably see it if you take a lot of digital photos is a lot of cameras will just record things this way automatically. So your file names will look like 2013-0503, so you know that was taken uh, May 3rd, 2013. Now Windows may show it to you a different way, like it, it says, by the way, this was created on this nice, on this day and they have it written out with Friday and the time and all kinds of nice things. But if you actually open up this file like with notepad or something and look in it, the way it's recorded in that file is ISO 8601. So this is, this is a very good, very common format for dates. Um, and I also wanna take a moment and frown at Excel's date format um, because it's very insistent that you use it and it's not good at all. Um, so I think it looks weird. I'm just so used to my good friend ISO 8601 that when I type a date in that way and it changes it to like 11411, like what does that even mean? Um, or if I type in a month in that format, it changes it to like AUG 16 or something like that. And internally even, it's storing it in a really strange way. It's storing it as the number of days since the beginning of 1900 unless you're on a Mac, and it's the number of days since the beginning of 1904. So if, you ever, if you're ever uh, saving an Excel file, and it's giving you those little, hey, this format might not be very stable, that's a lot of what it's talking about. <laughs> Sometimes it's talking about this date, is by the way, this isn't going to export nicely, it's not gonna convert nicely. So when I do dates in Excel files, a lot of the time the first thing I do is I just change that column to text, and I store ISO 8601 there because if you ever need to export, if you ever need to get 
anything out of that Excel document and you want it to be anything normal, um, you need to do this because otherwise, if you have like AUG 16 in there, it's just going to export AUG 16 and no other program is going to sort that nicely. Um, so dates are very important to me. <laughs> All right, uh, another, another type of metadata is structural metadata. Uh, this indicates how different parts of the data set relate to each other or to the world more broadly. Um, so example, uh, one example is how your file set relates to say an article about it or how different files in your data set relate to each other if they have a, an internal structure. Uh, one example of this is if you have the same data, like roughly the same data, but in files of different types for different reasons. Um, one, per, one reason you might do this is because the images have different purposes. Like for images, uh, you could have a TIFF that was your original capture. This is your highest quality. This is how you captured it. Um, but you don't want to put that on the web, so you might have a JPEG for web display or a JPEG 2000 for multi-resolution display, or a PDF, because someone, someone might want a PDF if you want to send it to them. Uh, or if it's uh, like a newspaper page or a book page, you might have XML of its OCR text, just the words on the pages in a searchable file. Um, another reason you might do this is for scientific data. Like if you're taking measurements off of an instrument and it's saving files, it might save them in its internal proprietary weird format and call it dot dat that nothing else in the world can read except that instrument. Um, but it might have the option to save, say, in Excel, and so, which other people can read. Or if you don't like Excel because it's messing with your dates, you can save to CSV. Or you might have documentation for that file about what settings you used. And so you might have a README file. And so all of these, one nice way to do structural metadata um, for these kinds of situations is to just have all these files together and they all have different extensions, but they all have the same first name. So you could have green.tiff.jpg.jp2 and so on. And that's a nice common example of structural metadata, just showing the relation in this way. Um, another uh, pretty broad category of metadata is administrative metadata. Uh, this includes things like technical metadata, preservation metadata, rights metadata, uh, and lots of things that just don't fit into these nice categories. Um, so in archives, um, there's a kind of administrative metadata you see fairly often, uh, which is a custodial history of your collection. And you have the same thing with a lot of files. They have, they have a history that they've gone through. Uh, I like this comic. It's from... Uh, the, uh, the web comic piled higher and deeper, and it's a story told in file names. And if you look at it, so they all start with data, and they all have roughly the same date. They kind of come in a sequence, and then they all have some other word where you can see kind of what's in that data. And so that first one is a test, then a retest, then a re-retest, calibrate, huh? And then it gets angrier. <laughs> like, around 3 a.m., it's starting to get angrier as it goes on. But then somewhere around 4 a.m. you have woohoo filed by use this one. <laughs> and uh, and then somewhere the next day you have starting over dot dad. So it's, <laughs> it comes full circle and it's very sad. But I think a lot of people do ha have file systems that look like this because if you get something kind of working or kind of like you like it, but you want to make some changes and see how it works, you might save it and say, okay, this is version one. And then you have, I have another one next to it. And then finally you get one you like and say, okay, this one's called final. Final, this is the one I'm, but then you make a change so you have final two. And so, so it doesn't, yeah, so, so this, isn't, this isn't the greatest way to, to handle this. Um, I recommend version control for things like this. Um, there are a number of systems you can use for this, like Git, uh, like GitHub, uh, Subversion, Mercurial, these are all nice. Uh, you can use them to keep track of when files changed, what content changed in them, uh, who changed them, so you can have people working together in a system like this, and why, when you make a save and kind of commit to a system like this, you can say, well, I changed this for this reason so you know why it changed. Uh, it keeps your file system tidy, so you don't have these 
002s or finals or anything like that. Um, and it's also a nice way to do backups. So once you have your files in a system like this, you can just go back to any version um, without the, uh, the headache in your uh, file system and often without taking up a lot more space. Um, um, it stores metadata, so <laughs> and, and and they're and they're very different. Um, there are nice interfaces to these. I think some of them um, just work with Windows, where you can right-click your file and say, "I'd really like the version from this time," and and you can go back and look. And some of these things are just in Windows and in repositories automatically. Like here, we have shadow copies going on in Windows, so you can go back and get some previous versions. Um, and this is. This is just something to know about, something to keep in mind, and something that when you're putting data in a repository to kind of keep an eye out of whether they provide a version control for your documents. So another category of uh, administrative metadata is technical metadata. This helps you to decode or render or interpret the data. Um, some examples of this are file format, like is it compressed? Uh, has any processing been done on it already? Um, and how was the data gathered? What, what equipment was used? What settings were used um, on this instrument? So here's an example from cataloging. Um, and it's just a, a time when it's important to understand your tools and to understand your procedures. So when we're cataloging a book, uh, in RDA, one thing we record is the dimensions of the book. That's what that element is called, is dimensions. And we do this by recording something like 24 centimeters. So what does that mean? If, if you don't know RDA, how are you going to interpret that? Is it the height of the book? Is it the width? Is it the biggest dimension? Is it the diameter? What would it even be? It's just what's one uh, element. And so... Um, if you go and look at RDA, there's a procedure which says you measure the height in centimeters and you round up, and then you only include the width if it's greater than the height or less than half the height. And so if you see 24 centimeters in a record, you know that the height is between 23 and 24 centimeters, and the width of the book is between 12 and 24 centimeters. So it, this is technical metadata that lets you know how to interpret what, what does 24 really mean based on the tools that you're using. Um, there's a, another kind of technical metadata we use when uh, we're microfilming or digitizing called targets. These are technical targets. Um, for microfilm, a lot of the time we have this line pair target. And so what you can do is you can, uh, before you film any of your documents, you film this target and it has line pairs. And you can see the, the ones with it say 1.0 are kind of far apart. And then as the numbers, they get bigger, they get, the lines get closer and closer together until you get to the one you can't see, which I think says 18, where they're extremely close together. So you film this target and then you film the rest of your document. And then when you look at your microfilm, like after it's developed, you get out your loop and you look at it and you see which one of these can you tell the difference between the two lines that are next to each other? What is the largest number or the smallest distance that you can interpret? And this is a technical measure of how your camera was functioning that day. And so it lets you know what you can reasonably say um, about the data on that film. Um, and for digital capture, we have similar, similar ones uh, so you know what kind of grays your camera is getting. Um, and I have a favorite story about when this has been important. So there's a really nice episode of Nova where they uh, challenge teams of scientists to identify art forgeries based on, uh, based on digital images of them. And so the, the team had, had a hypothesis where they, they thought that uh, anyone who was trying to do a forgery was going to be trying harder and more detailed than the original artist. It was going to have more brush strokes. So there was going to be a higher density of brush strokes, so more contrast. And so that's what they looked for. They looked for the images with the most contrast. These are going to be the forgeries. And they did the test, and they were right. But they found out later that the one that was done later, the forgery, it had its picture taken with a better camera. So it had higher resolution on the camera, so it was able to interpret more of that. And so of course it had higher contrast, of course it had higher detail, it was a better camera. Um, and so because they didn't take this technical metadata into account, they drew some wrong conclusions 
about their data. The, they were not wrong. I mean, it happened to be correct, and I think they went and they got fresh images and, uh, and did it again. But, um, yeah. Um, so another type, another category of metadata is preservation metadata. This helps with long-term management of data. Um, so it generally lets you know, is this the same data set that I think it is? Uh, are all the files here? Are they all the same versions I think they are? Has any data rot occurred? Has a file been truncated? Did it survive a transfer when I moved it around? Um, some common formats for this, there's a nice XML complicated format called Premise. Uh, it includes a lot of checksums. Um, these are a nice kind of preservation metadata. Um, one version of a checksum you see a lot of the time in libraries is the check digit on an ISBN. Um, so you can see I have them all colored in different ways. So what you, what you can do for an ISBN is there's an algorithm where you take all the numbers in the odd positions, all the green ones, and add them up. And then you add to that all the numbers in the even positions times three. And then you divide by 10, subtract the remainder from 10, and you get this check digit. You get this digit between zero and one. And that's the yellow one on the end. That's that digit on the end. So if you have an ISBN and you want to know, is this a good ISBN? Did somebody skip a digit or did they repeat a digit? Or did they transpose two digits? Then this math problem is going to turn out wrong. You're going to get a wrong check digit. And so this is something that even our cataloging tools, when we enter them, a lot of the time they'll go, that's not right. And so, so it, because it's checking, it's doing this check digit to make sure we're entering things correctly. And so this is, this is just an example of a checksum. And the others work very similarly to this. So if you have a big file and you wanna make sure it's preserved over time, one thing you can do is uh, run one of these checksum programs. And there are ones called like MD5SUM, SHA1SUM. These are kind of common ones. And you can store, it, it'll just make this little file that's much smaller than the original file most of the time. And you can just store it next to the other one. And then if you ever want to know if that file is still OK, if it's transferred properly, you just run that program again. You compare the two checksums. And if they're the same, you know you're with a lot of confidence that your file is the same. Um, so this is this is an example of preservation metadata. Um, another category of metadata is rights metadata. Um, so are there any intellectual property rights attached to your data? So how can you access or use or reuse your data? Uh, what's the copyright? Are there any confidentiality issues? Um, or is there a license like Creative Commons attached to your license or attached to your data? Um, and I've been seeing Creative Commons a lot more related to data sets um, uh, as people start talking more and more about open data. So according to the Open Data Handbook, open data is data that can be freely used, reused, and redistributed by anyone, subject at most to the requirement to at attribute and share alike. Um, and so some examples of common uh, Creative Commons license, one of these is CC0, which means there are no restrictions at all. Um, I've been seeing a lot of people putting this on their catalog records lately. Just when they put their catalog records in OCLC, they just add this little license and say, by the way, I'm declaring this to be CC0, and it can be used with no restrictions. Um, another one is uh, CC BY. Uh, which means that appropriate attribution is required. You might notice a lot of these little pictures I have throughout my presentation, like this lock, have an attribution underneath them. Uh, it's because I got them from the Noun Project, and that's their license, is their CC BY. So I can use them as long as I uh, attribute them. Uh, another one that's really common is CC BY SA, so share alike. And share alike means um, copies or adaptations of that data. You can use them, you can adapt them, uh, but anything you really release must be under the same license as the original. So it must be also um, CC by SA or, or similar. I'm not a lawyer, but <laughs> that's very close to what's true. Um, uh, one, one example of uh, CC by SA, um, all of Wikipedia articles are under this license. All right, so if you have data um, 
and you're trying to decide what metadata to use. Um, so some things to think about is if you're going to deposit your data into a repository, do they have requirements? Then that's a that's a good way to start. A good place to. Um, it, and it's better to start sooner than later on that. Um, also, does your discipline have a common standard, like a, a standard that they typically use? Or even your department, do they have something that's commonly used? It's good to have more of your data be uniform if you want to be able to use it together. Um, and also, just what would be helpful in searching and using your data? So you have a lot of options. Um, so, but what, what is going to be most useful to you? Um, because here, so here's um, part of a metadata set I downloaded for some uh, uh, photographs, and it includes their latitude and longitude. Um, it's, very, it's very detailed, but if this is not the sort of way you want to search your data, you may not need to store or collect anything quite so complex. Um, so a fairly common practice, like I mentioned, is to use a directory structure and file name to label things. Um, it's pretty easy to browse, like however you set it up, it's pretty easy to browse that way. Um, it's fairly fragile, like if you move a file accidentally, suddenly all that meaning is gone. Um, it's still a pretty good idea to do this, this is a fine way, um, but it sh probably shouldn't be the only way that you're, uh, that you're organizing your files. Uh, another nice thing to do is to have readme files. Um, so this is a text file accompanying your data. Um, you usually want plain text, not MS Word. Um, and people do readme files a lot of different ways. Um, so you can have one readme file for your whole data set. You can have one per file, one per directory. Um, and it can include a lot of different things, like if you have tabular data, you might have an associated readme file that said this is what these columns actually mean this is how we recorded them um, and uh, this is the processing that's been done to get this column to this column um, how, uh, and uh, it should follow it uh, within your data set you should at least follow a consistent structure and there may be an existing structure for readme files in your uh, in your discipline um, here's an example of a readme file there's a some software that I use to do programming for microprocessors. And when you start a new project, the very first thing it does is it makes you a little readme read file for you to fill in. And it's already got your name and the date and it's suggested license. And then little things like project, put, put the file's name or put the project's name here. Describe it. What does it take to install? What's the schematic? And so it encourages uh, people using this software to do their readmes in a common format. Um, another thing you can do is a database or a spreadsheet. Uh, this is useful if you have lots of data files, say you're collecting the same kind of data every day. And if you really want to be able to find things and search for them. Um, it's more restrictive in format than a readme file, but, but like I said, it's going to be easier to search. And it's easy, easier to summarize and tabulate. Um, and if your uh, columns aren't clear exactly what they mean, they might need their own readme file, so you know. All right, so now we've gotten to the activity. Uh, has everyone downloaded? Um, okay, well, so I'm going to encourage you to work in groups. So somebody, uh, somebody in your group needs to have them downloaded. Um, and uh, there are two of them. There's A and B. So do you guys, how about you guys do A? Actually, how about everything, everybody on that side of the room do A, and everybody on this side of the room do B. And those of you um, from the live stream, you can pick either one to do. So, um, so once these files are downloaded, um, I want you to create some metadata. There's already some metadata in there. Uh, this data set is, then there's a big description in there. It's a, a collection of photos of people's pets from within the library. And I've asked them to include things like the pet's names, when the photos were taken. Uh, you can probably tell by looking at the photos, whether they're cats or dogs or guinea pigs or whatever they are. And I'm going to ask you, what, once you've gotten this metadata uh, worked through, I'm going to ask you questions 
like find a picture of one of my pets in here or how many pictures in there have dogs in them and how many pictures are taken before 2013. Um, and you can do this metadata any way you want. If you think it's easier to organize things into, um, into directories, you can rename the files if you want. If you want to use a spreadsheet, um, I, I've included kind of a little starter spreadsheet with one row in there. I'm not saying that's the best way to do it, um, but it is a way to do it. Um, and let's see, what time is it? It's 2.44. Okay. Um, all right. Let's, um, let's take about 20 to 30 minutes. We'll, we'll check in after 20 minutes to see how people are doing. Yes. Okay. 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 All right. Okay, so we are going to pause the online recording and um, uh, we will still be in the chat to answer questions, um, but we will be back in 20 minutes. All right. So, so what did you guys do? What does your metadata look like? Okay, spreadsheet. Did a lot of people do spreadsheets? Yeah. A Word document, okay, good. Okay, so we have spreadsheet, Word document, anything else? Okay, that works. Um, and what kind of things did you record? Type of animal, name, contributor, date, color, yep. Ooh, breed when possible, I like that. Okay. Let's see. Um, all right, so let's do our first question. Uh, so find a cat. This is kind of a softball, should be easy. <laughs> and what's its name? You can, you can shout it out once you find one. Angel, good. Mr. Bean, Mr. Bean. good. Pookie, okay. Nico Nico, okay. <laughs> okay, good, any, any trouble finding cats? in this database, because I could put more in there. <laughs> okay. Uh, and now find a non-mammal. Find an animal that's not a mammal. And what kind of animal is it? Snail, good. A bird, okay. Turtles, fish, and a, and a snake, and a stuffed animal, okay. Yep. He's, he's masquerading as a mammal. He's <laughs> you, you saw right through him. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, find one of Cindy's pets. Cindy, you know. <laughs> and what's, what, are, what are some of her pets' names? Pepper and Milo, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's got some unnamed pets too. So, yeah, so she's got some turtles, fish, and snake that don't have names. Eve and Max. Mm -hmm. Yep, the dogs. Okay. Um, all right, and here's another one about names. How many pets' names start with P? Okay, so, so if you don't have a spreadsheet, this one's going to be harder. You might have to do some counting. Pogo and Pepper and yeah, yeah, that one's tricky. Yeah, what if what if pet, what if pets have nicknames? How do you count them? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So my my question 
a lot of my questions aren't all that clear. Cin Cindy who? Yeah. <laughs> Cindy Lou who? <laughs> Don't tell her I said that. <laughs> okay. But are, are you able to find like, all, the, all the pets that start with P and kind of group them together? Okay. All right. Uh, find a picture taken in 2013. And who's in it? Okay. Turtles are in 2013. Okay. Grover and Earl. Good. In 2013. Chickens. Chickens in 2013. Good. Good. So we have a bunch of 2013 photos. Um, how many pictures were taken after May of 2016? So only very recent pictures of animals. Okay, you, you found three, good. Yeah, but three, okay. <laughs> Okay. C3 also. Okay. All right. So here's the next question. How many pets live indoors? And how many pets greet you at the door? Okay. I'm not going to let you look too long on this because it's not in there. Okay. So this, is, this is just kind of a reminder that if there are things you want to search for, you need to encode them. And you need to ask for them when you're gathering your data to start with. So what problems did you run into? So you saw how I gathered the data. I just kind of sent people some email and said, send me pictures of your pets. And I just kind of stuck in that directory what I got. So would you have done something differently to make this process easier? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so even in a spreadsheet, you might have had some trouble with the, the photos that had two dogs or a dog and a cat together. Like, how do you handle that? Yeah, Ruth. Repeated rows? Okay, good. Yeah, good. Yeah, so you, so you can repeat rows if you have more than one animal. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, uh, and, and there was a lot of information, or there was some information that I asked for that some people just didn't provide, which is fine. And so I just chose not to follow up. A lot of incomplete dates, yep. Yeah, and some, some of them you might be able to guess, like if it was in the file headers or if it was in the file name, you might be able to kind of glean a date from it. But those, like I said, are fragile. Like somebody might have renamed the file or some of those dates um, just get cleaned out of your file. Like if you upload it to Google Docs or something to share it with someone, those dates are gone. It's, it's a security thing. So they, they just clean them out. Um, and so, so that, that's some, a, a case when you can't count on it being there. Okay, so um, having answered the questions now, would you have done anything different? assigning the metadata, like did I ask you something you weren't prepared for or weren't expecting? You would use the spreadsheet? Okay. <laughs> okay. Anything else? Did, did you record enough and the, the right kinds of things? Okay, good. Okay, well we're gonna put that to a test because we're gonna switch with another group and they're going to try to use your metadata to find stuff in the data sets. Okay, and so uh, if you are attending the live stream, this is when you're going to use the part two data. Um, so there's a spreadsheet in there that is um, uh, it, something like complete metadata, but maybe not great. <laughs> um, so, so if you're doing that one, then go ahead and download uh, that one and I'm going to be asking some more questions. So go ahead and switch with another group. What's that? Uh, I mean, stand up and go to another desk. So phys physically stand up and go to another desk. Yeah. No, 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 this is not. 
Okay, so I'll give you about five minutes to get reacquainted with your, to get acquainted with the metadata. Oh, no, no, that's, that's the website for, for, for live stream. Uh, so look at the other person's metadata, see what they assigned, and I'll be asking another set of questions. But you'll be trying to find things in their data this time. Yeah. It's the test. <laughs> And I have more questions for you. So find a bird and tell me its name. Mango, good. Any other birds? Yep. <laughs> Christy had an advantage because it's her bird. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Did I hear someone say they found a chicken? Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's, there's not many birds in there. There's a couple. Okay. Um, find a picture that has two animals. And tell me who they are. Julia and Jethro, okay. Ashley and Winona, yep. <laughs> yep, with two animals together in a picture. Cleopatra and Calypso, the guinea pigs, yep.
Any any other pairs of animal buddies? That says what? Oh, Stephanie Aiken had two two pets together. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so that might that might be hard. Depending on how you did your metadata, you might not be able to find that. You might have to go back to the data to tell. Yep. All right. Um, find one of Mary's pets. And what's its name? Gabby, Chessie, uh huh. Jethro. Eli. Okay. Ziva. Okay. Um, how many pets' names start with R? Okay. I'm hearing one, two, three. Okay. So there's a. <laughs> There's a Rupert and a Raven. Huh? Okay. Um, so find a picture taken in 2014 and tell me who's in it. <laughs> Frosty, Oberon, okay. Milo and Pepper. Nico, uh huh. Oberon, okay. Any other 2014 animals? Ziva, okay. Um, and how many pictures were taken after October of 2016? So very recent pictures. I mean, I'm here. I'm hearing two. Any, two? Okay. Three. Three from over there. Okay. All right. So, what problems did you have this time? Did you have better luck with your own metadata, or <laughs> I'm seeing some laughing? So some people did. But, uh, or did did it really make a difference? Are we just all great at metadata? So. Oh, you had pr trouble sorting. Okay. Well, it's an issue. I mean, you have you have to have it in. Yeah, it would have been an issue. You have to have a um, uh, have your metadata in a system that you know how to sort and that you know how to search, and that's not going to fight you back. And yep. Okay. Um, mine was far better. <sighs> Of course it is. <laughs> um, so do you think they, your, the other people had better luck with yours? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jennifer says it's natural to have better luck with your own. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you know what you're expecting. Mm hmm yeah yeah oh yeah 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 so they might have chosen different fields than you did yeah it does it, it takes more time to make good metadata Yep, that is true. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to know what other people want and you really have to know like what kind of questions are gonna be asked. Like what sorts of things, I mean, you have all the information there. You have it all in that Word document, I mean, as much as you can have, um, but you have to know which of it to index. And maybe at the point you're collecting it, which of those fields are really important to you? Like you might might go back and ask and say, now, now really, is is it Cleopatra or is it Pat? 
for like just for official official purposes what are we going to name your pet um, yeah Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Christy says it's a, it's hard for researchers to think about metadata in this way with with an eye toward other people using using the data. All right. Well, great. Um here are some references. Um so the just about about metadata generally and about uh metadata for for research data. And thank you for coming. We have an online evaluation form. Um, it's from that same link where you downloaded it, the, downloaded the data set. There's also a link um, to, uh, to the evaluation form. And let us know how we did. Let us know what else you want to hear about from this committee. So thank you. And this concludes the video and the workshop, data management and metadata. Thank you very much for coming.